two key differences really with nuclear weapons, dial yield, I think that's critical. The other piece is if you look at a conventional explosion, that's 90 something percent of the energy goes into the blast wave, the shock wave that's destroying buildings. And you get a little bit of thermal heat and fires from it, but the vast majority of the energy is the shock wave. Nuclear weapons are very different. The first that we tend to not talk about too much, but it's important is the fireball. It's literally the temperature of the sun. It's going to vaporize anything within that range. Fairly small, a few hundred meters across to maybe a kilometer across for the very large weapons. But I don't want to forget to mention that because the fireball is what's causing all these other effects. So the shock wave, that blast wave propagates out. Uh, at first, it's supersonic. It's actually moving faster than the speed of sound. So you can imagine, you've heard a sonic boom. Well, you can imagine what that's doing that on the surface from a, a bomb blast. And that causes most of the immediate structure damage. The other thing that happens is the thermal radiation. It's burning, it's the temperature of the sun. You're taking a piece of the sun and putting it on the earth. So it's causing flash burns and fires of anything combustible, sometimes 20, 30 miles from the detonation site. So that's a, a huge thing. So the first thing is the blast wave tears up the buildings and stirs things up. Then the thermal radiation sets everything on fire. So it's a, you're getting the worst effects of a shock wave and a firestorm. And then the radiation. One of the scary, fascinating things about nuclear bombs, and particularly this gets to the small yield. So you look at, say, a B-61 that's set for the 300 ton setting, the blast size is maybe 300 meters across, but the radiation is deadly out to 600 meters. So that's where some of the, your older listeners may remember the neutron bomb or enhanced radiation weapons. Those went out of fashion in the 80s, partly for the reason that it's kind of creepy that you can set this bomb off and kill people, but leave the buildings and tanks and things fairly much intact. And so that uh, went away in the 80s. But, you know, just like fashion and MTV, uh, we're back, you know, we, it's back to the 80s. And we've now built those weapons that at the time, were speculative. So that's the key things. You've got the th shockwave, you've got thermal radiation, you've got immediate ionizing radiation. That's your immediate effects. Longer term. Well, you have, those are delayed effects, things like the fallout. You So a lot of material that gets sucked into the blast is irradiated, becomes radioactive. You've got debris from the bomb. You know, even at a high-end nuclear blast, you're only consuming 30 or so percent of the of the material in the device. So the rest of that radioactive material just gets spewed all over the place. And so that becomes radioactive fallout. That can fall for hundreds of miles away from the site and last for hundreds of years. So you think about Chernobyl, you know, we're still talking about the fact that people driving through that area stir up dust. You've got areas in Europe, hot spots, where you can't drink the milk from the cows because the radioactive isotopes are still in the soil, it ends up in the grass. And this is not in Russia, we're talking about in parts of Poland and parts of Germany where you still get radioactive milk from cows eating stuff that's left over from a nuclear reactor accident 40 years ago. Well, imagine you set off a few dozen or a few hundred nuclear weapons, again, a limited exchange, you're going to have these hot spots all over the world for decades that's contaminating our food and water. And that's just the immediate radiation effects, the particulates, the dust, the soot. That ends up getting blasted into the stratosphere. It's going to hang out there for years. So you potentially can end up with even a small exchange of a few dozen weapons could cause cooling in the atmosphere, which could impact crops, the particulates, the settling, the obstructing of the normal sunlight can interfere with the oceanic food chain. You collapse or damage the oceanic food chain. You've just caused a real problem for all life on this planet. And that's not even from, that's before we get to the really bad scenarios of thousands of nukes going off. You, in a recent email to me, said there are three countries um, that have the potential to destroy life on Earth. That was your quote. Can you explain how that would happen? And to be clear, because I actually, 
I actually had a, there was an ecologist that corrected me on that. Of course, we're not talking about kill, destroying life on Earth. We are talking about destroying virtually anything bigger than a cockroach. So to me, that's right. You know, yeah, right. yeah. I mean, you're so to be clear, you're complex life, complex life. Yeah. So. Low that, level. that seems fantastical exaggeration to me. So I would like yeah. you to be explicit on how that could happen. It isn't. The reason being that for twofold, first off, with a large scale exchange of, say, 3,000, again, remember that strategically each side has, you know, on, on the order of 2,000 strategic weapons. These are the big missiles, the submarine launch. Let's say that half of those on each side get deployed and go off. So you have, that's 2,000 nuclear weapons going off in the Northern Hemisphere, a few in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, so the amount of radiation, the amount of material ejected into the atmosphere, roughly equivalent, we think. And I, the problem with some of these is, is that the modeling tends to get into classified materials, but there have been some public studies. That kind of an exchange, you're talking same level of impact as the asteroid impact at the uh, end of the Cretaceous that killed off the dinosaurs. So, right there is your Be, because because world. of what because of the particulate in the in the atmosphere and shutting out the sun or yeah or exactly what else? that's the nuclear winter scenario you get particulates you get soot uh, ejected into the stratosphere that causes uh, a tremendous diminution of sunlight and energy reaching the surface and that's we haven't even and that's a separate. That's separate than the radiation. Completely separate from the radiation. You're talking about having 30% of the Northern Hemisphere uninhabitable for several centuries, not to mention all the radioactive dust blowing around and contaminating everything else. So even assuming you don't have catastrophic ecosystem collapse from the cooling and loss of sunlight, the radiation is going to be such a severe problem. And that's not even getting to some of the other issues that we talked about that obviously that kind of exchange, you've just destroyed all of the mechanisms of human civilization. Forget economies and energy use and all those other things. The, you know, when you've killed off 2 billion people and destroyed most of the functioning economies in the world, you know, the people that are left, it's not gonna be a pretty sight. But again, the most likely scenario is you have catastrophic uh, nuclear winter, you end up with catastrophic ecosystem failures, and that's before you even get to the radioactive effects and radiation effects. I, I wanted to have this conversation with you because I think more people need to understand the the seriousness of this risk, and I was hoping that people would listen to it and think about it and share it, but I'm just my initial reaction is uh, I'm going to lose listeners because of this conversation. But um, here's the thing. We can do something about this. Okay. We've already, well, we're going to get to that. We've I know already, that. we've I, already, I, I, and again, it is depressing, but we already did something about this once in the eighties. We actually did significant de-escalation. but back to the, the topic at hand, that big exchange, you, know, you get into arguments, whether or not it's possible. I think it is because I think, people in the heat of the moment get dumb pretty fast uh in the past well it's at that point though it's at that point it's almost the evolutionary game theory of spite which is oh my it god is. all these missiles are heading our way those bastards we we're done we better take them with us i mean it's like it's it if i can't win i'm gonna i'm gonna lose and and make them pay more sort of thing so that's absolutely true and Although it does raise an interesting question of during the Cold War, we came very close to exchanges and it, they were prevented not by policy, not by, uh, you know, brilliant technical systems. They were prevented by single moral and ethical individuals who said, wait a minute, the consequences of the I'm not going to follow instructions. That's the irony of, of, of the preventing nuclear wars. A lot of times it's people going against the rules and saying, you know, I don't want to end civilization. Isn't that just a profound 
insight that there's this tragedy of the commons and collective action problems and the cleverness of our species in and nuclear weapons is is the pinnacle of cleverness trumping wisdom and the superorganism and all that but the things that actually provide wisdom are at the individual human level and and that that's how this has been uh, uh, avoided in the past it's individual human beings making the humane decision. Could that happen again? Uh, I think it could. I hope it could. I would like to believe that it could. It scares me that, unfortunately, part of the thing that we're discussing, you know, does, I grew up with the threat of nuclear weapons. I knew what it would do. Are the young officers, the middle grade officers and middle grade people in the State Department, even at the upper levels, um, are they aware, are they just going to let things go on autopilot? Are they as frightened of nuclear war as they should be? And I wanna, that's, I think, a very important point is that doesn't mean being paralyzed. It doesn't mean that you just give up and, and it, but what it does mean is that you understand at a deep human level. That's what I was referring to earlier. The problem is it's so easy as an academic exercise. It's horrific. I see it in myself, how fascinating it is that you see the physics, you see the complexity of the problem and you start to go down those little rabbit holes but it's we're talking about human life here and the life on this on on earth and i would like to think that is foremost in people's minds but you know the guys making the decisions in the 80s had to do duck and cover exercises in elementary school the guys making the decisions now didn't have to go through that and i'm not sure that's a good thing <laughs>